Okay, um, just to, uh, I missed a bit of recording, so I'm just going to um, say what we've put on the agenda. We started talking about the clash of customization names, um, and then I mentioned some dodgies. Uh, feedback on getting started, which she's given me links for. So I'm going to put those in the agenda doc. Other stuff that's on the agenda. Um, libgit to follow up and a couple of things about the image controllers. Um, I put the follow up, libgit to follow up on there because I thought there might be follow on tasks from after merging the uh, alternate Git implementation PR, which by the way, congratulations. Thank you. It's, um, I feel I feel like I started this when I was a young man. <laughs> uh, so I started writing some documentation. Uh, I kind of just took that and found the fact that we released the source controller version. Um, and I don't know. I I've added it as like a note about Azure DevOps. I don't really know how to make it more clear. There are always going to be questions. People are like, are basically not going to read the documentation and end up asking the same question. Just it doesn't work for Azure DevOps, even if it's in the documentation. So, as long as we have somewhere to link and go, okay, here it is. Here, read this. I think we should be fine. Um, and I've added a in that same PR. I added a option to uh, flux create a source or git source where you can set the git implementation type. Uh, so um, I, I probably just need to add more information uh, to the docs changes. It's a draft right now. Oh, you've got a draft PR? Uh, yeah. On docs changes? OK. Yeah, and in flux too. So yeah. it's, uh, I just felt like I had to get something started last night, so I just did it quickly. Um, what else? I, I just think we need, we need to make it a bit more clear about, or is the plan now to get the image automation things merged before or released with the 0 0.5, or is that going to wait after, after Christmas? I think it'll wait. Okay. I think it's a bit of a rush because I'm off next week from next week until after New Year. So, and Stefan and Hida got a holiday as well. I think Stefan, have you? You've got holiday just a week later. Hida certainly has. Oh, I can't hear you. Is it? Sorry. Yeah. So you are going on vacation next week. Me and Hide will be around next week, but starting uh, with the 20th, no one will be around. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, we are looking at three weeks of uh, no support, basically. I'll, I'll be working in 20. The 21st and 22nd, so I'll, I can try to answer questions in Slack, but then I'll, I'll probably, 23rd, I'll, I will sign off totally from the internet for a couple of days. A whole couple of days, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. I mean, obviously, you don't mean Twitter and stuff, right? Yeah, uh, still be on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And Reddit and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to try, I don't know, to get some other one quick change in a customization controller before we release. But it should not block anything. If I don't get it done, we should just release anyways. 
But it, what, what is left for, for Libya 2 more than documentation? Do we have any major things? For 05? Yeah. So the, uh, the docs change are sure, and the CLI update just extra flag. But more than that, do we have anything? So my plan for flag 05 will be release source controller uh, today. Um, Kevin wanted to create a pull request to add uh, more metadata to the Kubernetes events. For example, when, I don't know, um, if you want to use Tekton or another system uh, with notification controller, you may want to have the branch and commit uh, as separate fields because it's hard to, I don't know, split strings in Tekton pipelines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Kevin proposed for each source type to um, uh, create dedicated uh, metadata in the event. For example, for a Git repository, it will be URL, it will be branch and um, commit. For bucket and, and Helm uh, repository, it will be URL and checksum because that's mm -hmm. what we actually use for the revision there. Uh, they are not Git sources. Uh, but that can come uh, later if uh, I'll, I'll ping Kevin again uh, now. If he's not around, um, I will not block the 0 05 uh, release on that. So then we can release source controller. Then we have to update the source controller API in, um, in customize and um, customize notification and, and handle controller. Then we can release notification controller. We have uh, new features in there. Um, and um, the fix for, for GitHub uh, spam, right? We are spamming GitHub uh, yeah. copying status API. Mm -hmm. So that, that's already merged. Um, for customized controller, I would really like to get um, the image overrides in the API for 0 0.5, and I'm going to um, try to get it in today. So, Tochi, are you okay uh, today to work together on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. That sounds good. Great. So, the idea around uh, the image uh, change is um, like we, we discussed months ago, um, so the you can patch uh, you can patch an image tag inside the customization.yaml file, but that works if the platform admin uh, has control over the app repo and the fleet repo. But it will not work if, for example, you want to um, change you want to patch an image for a repository you have no control over. For example, you will create a Git repo definition for, um, I don't know, contour, con the contour ingress controller. You cannot go in there and say, hey, inside your customization.yaml, I want to place this thing and I want Flux to write back to your public repo. That's not going to work, right? So um, you have two options. You either um, copy the files from contour repo to your own repo and you maintain the files there, which is kind of a uh, manual hard thing that will be unsynchronized, or you can create a customization object inside your fleet repo and override uh, the images there. Then you can tell the image update controller, hey, write the, the new tag in here in my customization custom resource. Um, so right now we covered the first um, use case where when you own app repos and fleet repos, then you can just patch it directly in your deployment file or patch it in your customization.yaml. But when you don't have that access, you have to use a customization custom resource and uh, patch the things inside the fleet repo. And that's what we want to cover uh, with the image override uh, with help from, from Sontochi. Uh, so that's for uh, for customized uh, customization con customized controller 0 0.5. Maybe I don't know, Philip, if you have the time to look into that um, bug around events where if 
even if the health check recovers, the event will say that the health check fails, right? That's, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. That, that's the one I was talking about. I was trying to get done. I, I, was, uh, I spent last night uh, trying to reproduce the bug in a test uh, to be able to uh, well, uh, both, both make sure that we don't reintroduce it, but also try to reproduce it in a more controlled manner. Because right now I've, I have it in a customer environment where I can basically see the exact same thing happening and it's, it's affecting me also. So I was very confused when I don't know, I remember his name when he started posting these things. And I was like looking at this, so I'm like, what the hell is happening here? Because it's sending the correct message with the wrong severity. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm right now just trying to figure out if this is something I can reproduce in the whole in-memory testing clusters, or if this is something that actually requires like a proper cluster with the issues of like the realities of threading and distributed systems or this is just so like... my hunch is that we uh, we uh, take the status sub the old status sub resource instead of looking at the new one yeah and that's why the um, the state is failed when it should be right so we should pass the status as a pointer and defer the event, I think, or something like that. Yeah, it, it's just, either way, it's good to just be able to reproduce it in a test so that we can right. verify that we're not doing yeah. it. Like mm -hmm. We actually solve the problem. So, but, but this only affects also, uh, I think this only affects uh, people using commit status notifications. I don't think it affects people with like Slack and these types of things. No. Otherwise we would see a, a lot bigger this yeah, is only yeah. because we are, for the commit status uh, notifications, uh, also sending events and updates, uh, which we don't do for Slack. For Slack, we basically just uh, send the, the the first message. Yeah. So that, that's, that's kind of, I'll, I'll probably work on that. Uh, and uh, finally getting around to doing notification controller, documentate the guide, updating the guide, making sure that that is up to date. Uh, it's kind of my two things to have now after getting Glimpia 2 done. Yeah, and I, I think we should do at some point a blog post on, on, on the Flux website or I don't know, have a dedicated guide yeah. for Azure DevOps because now we support several things for them um, and all of them have some gotchas <laughs> and it will be great to put them together uh, in a single doc in a single I know, article, blog post, whatever for, for the Azure DevOps users, like mm -hmm. how you configure uh, your Git source from Azure DevOps, how you configure uh, your Helm uh, repository when you use Azure DevOps Helm thingy. There are some okay. gotchas there. Okay. How you set up uh, uh, SOPs decryption mm -hmm. with Azure KMS, how you set up a status commit for Azure DevOps and webhooks. Yeah. Right. I think uh, a guide for each environment would be pretty cool. I mean, starting with Azure DevOps because it's the one that has the most sort of compromises or special stuff perhaps. But yeah. you know, there's bound to be similar things for AWS, for GCP and so on. Yeah, for Flagger I have GKE, AKS and AEKS. For AWS and uh, GCP, you probably want to tell people also how they can use uh, Sealed Secret. No, it's, is it Sealed Secret? The KMS uh, kind of thing. SOPs, not Sealed Secret. Yeah, SOPs. Yeah, how you bind the IAM role with commands, with EKS cattle, with, I don't know. Asia, the Asia CLI, there are many, many things. I'm not going to get involved in that as I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm not that good with a cloud vendor. So someone that actually uses on a daily basis, these clouds should create this kind of uh, docs. Yeah. I, I could try to help with the Azure stuff as we are running stuff in Azure today. So, and I have it also on my agenda to write something about the whole SOPs with K Azure Key Vault and verifying that because that's always like, you know. Nice. In combination also then with the whole AAD pod identity stuff, which is mm -hmm. 
so we don't have to inject secrets in environment variables because that yeah. i mean it defends the whole purpose <laughs> like you yeah. should do that uh, it's useless you should use yeah. pgp instead of all of that but yeah mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so we discussed source controller 05, we discussed notification custom wise. Um, what is left is Helm controller. Um, Hideo, what's your plan with the refactoring? Are we going to get it in 05 or wait for next year? I'm still writing tests to cover all the edge cases, blah, blah, blah. Um, given the Helm's nature or automating Helm's nature, yeah, um, I don't think it's very wise to release it and then disappear for two weeks because it's doing automated things in a much more magical way than um, customizers doing it, for example. Um, so I think we should delay it. Uh, Sean should also have another look at it because the, the, it's pretty complex and we both see other um, pitfalls in the current um, implementation. Um, so no, it should be, I mean, it's more stable, but I would really like to be it's on point and not do another uh, couple of weeks of bug fixing once it is released, it should just be solid. Okay, so do we have anything new in Helm controller? Do we need to do a release or uh, we leave Helm controller on zero four to um, I think we can leave it on zero for if nothing comes up in the next couple of days. Um, I mean, the API is pretty well developed, right? Um, it's more about the internal things that, uh, that I'm working on right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, we... there's, one, there's one bug for the source controller that uh, touches the Helm area. It got reported yesterday. I'm still trying mm -hmm. the issue. Um, but I think Helm controller will stay on uh, 0.4. Okay. Just a quick question. What, what refactoring is being done in the Helm controller? Um, how can I explain this? Um, the previous or the current version for you of the Helm controller had like this um, a release cycle, which basically uh, did a couple of action based on the error status of the previous action. Um, the refactor um both tries to do more based on the observed state from the helm storage so that it doesn't solely rely on um, the previous action it did execute during that reconciliation and it also tries to take care of more advanced um edge case scenarios where for example um, the helm storage was mutated by some uh, human interaction or uh, something went wrong during the deploy and um, the Helm controller shut down and the um, release is now in some faulty state. So it tries to be more solid. Like um, we at Reverx have some people running it on um, more real life environments. And I've had bug reports from them from some edge case scenarios in case they are doing dozens of releases with it at the same time, etc. It all tries to take care of that and tries to, if it shuts down, for example, during the release cycle, then it should, and the release failed, um, then it should do um, uh, a remediation attempt next instead of doing another release again. Mm. Yeah, uh, sounds complicated. Yeah, with 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 customize or plain YAMLs or whatever, um, we can just reapply everything um, for the last sync commit. But this approach, this simplistic approach that works great because we have kubectl doesn't quite work with Helm. With Helm, we ha you have to figure out the Helm machinery itself and work with that. Um, and that's why 
helm control always be way more complicated than any other rec reconciler we, we have in, in Flux. Yeah, and the SDK isn't really um, helpful exactly. Because for example, if you, you have three types of errors in Helm, if you, for example, run an installation action um, and you look just at the error output from the installation action, um, it can mean three things. You can have no error and it will be deployed successfully, currently if you're not, or if you aren't waiting. You can receive an error back, but it may not be persisted to the Helm storage, which means that um, it was some type of validation error or whatever. And you have error three, and that means that it was persisted to the Helm uh, storage. So you now have new state you need to take into account. But um, um, it, it timed out on some waiting kind of thing. So to get around that, um, there now is an observer that literally observes the actions um, that the, the Helm action writes into the Helm storage. And then you can basically do observe space on the release object that was written in storage so that you don't have to solely rely on the uh, return from the SDK. It's like for any every every problem or every kind of simple solution you think there is, you need to build some advanced kind of things to take all the edge case scenarios into account because otherwise there will be some weird state that will trip up your uh, automation. Okay. That sucks. Uh, should we go into another agenda? Sure. I've got um, the image automation stuff in CLI. Um, I think that that big PR is ready to go as it is, um, although I, we don't want to merge it until after the release. Is that correct, Stefan? I mean, it makes sense. So we are going to do the Flux 205 release first. Then we have to do an API release of the image controllers. Then update the pull request with the Semver 010 or um, what you've decided for for this version, yeah. and then merge it. Um, even if we have the uh, the crude uh, the crud uh, actions, we don't have um, the installation bits, patches. Um, yes, that's true. Um, storage. Uh, I think we should also um, figure out. Uh, what it needs to happen to merge the uh, the storage bits so we can drop the in-memory implementation altogether. Um, I don't think we need two implementations because people can say to an empty deer, hey, I want this directory to be um, RAM disk. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. It's, I mean, yeah. it ends up being in-memory anyway. Yeah. And this is how, I don't know, Jaeger um, and others that are using Badger are doing it. Uh, I also, I was also thinking of providing a, a default in the custom resource definition for the uh, image automation part. So you don't have to specify a path inside um, anymore. If you don't specify it, it will default to dot slash. Um, that means, hey, I'm looking at all files inside the source. It's not, it's not even implemented, so. Um, it's not implemented, yeah. So that's, that's effectively what it does at present. Yeah. What would the default mean? You mean in code or in the CRD somehow? So in the CRD, you can provide defaults. Um, okay. It's just a uh, builder comment that you'll add on that field and say uh, builder default dot slash. And if it's not specified, then the Kubernetes API will inject that uh, value there. So it will uh, make our custom resource look nicer, a smaller um, 
easier to work with from the controller side also. Yeah. I mean, what I'm trying to do is get rid of the update uh, field uh, from the image update automation custom resource. It should work without specifying the update field. If we set um, the default path to dot slash, it shouldn't be dot, it should be dot slash. So it will match what customized controller does um, as the default, I mean. And um... What about the strategy? I know there's only one at present. So the idea would be it defaults to using setters. Yep. I mean, I see. Yeah. Okay. we should be able to define a default for the update field where is setters pass a single path dot slash. And if people don't don't add the update field, then uh, we'll generate it for them, or we can build this in in code. Uh, if we if Cube Builder doesn't know how to create defaults for this is an array, yeah. Um, why do you have why do we have multiple path here? Customize the customized custom resource supports a single path. Why would would we need different paths. So that you can pick out the things, the bits that you want to automate and leave the other ones out. Otherwise you'd have to define multiple automation things, which would also work, but seems, um, seems it's more parsimonious to just do it in one But you'd create an automation for a for an overlay. So why would you want to update two overlays? Because they will probably mean different things. One is production, one is staging. You definitely have different policies for them. Sure, but you might also have a Git repo that just has a bunch of um, directories, some of which you care about and some of which you don't. But if I don't have the setter inside, it doesn't really matter, right? To not touch files. So if I'm just leaving the default, hey, look at, at everything. But yeah. I have setters in there uh, with different image policy or no image policy at all, then it will not touch them, right? So I think most users will just run it with, uh, with the default path. That's everything inside the repo because- They may well do, yeah. I, so the- there's some there's some convention magic going on, which is that you name the policy um, in the file, and when the image automation runs, it looks for a policy named that in the same namespace as itself. So there is there is a bit of potential for that to go awry if you've got stuff in different namespaces and you're running image automations in different places or, or you, so, I mean, honestly, I did not spend a huge amount of time thinking about exactly how this would be used, but it did strike me that you might want to apply it to some things and not, not to other bits. Um, and if, if, if you allow people to pick out one path, then why not? more than one path. Yeah, I, I, for me, it doesn't make sense, but okay, we can leave it as more past. Um, I mean, if you, use, yes. if you use the customized controller to apply things, then you can only apply a path. Uh, that's your overlay. That's where you should be changing your images for that particular cluster um batching yeah so the the customized controller sort of forces you to break things down into individual customizations yes um right but that but there's no there's no reason for the automation to also do that 
if you see what I mean. Like you might want to just go, I have a bunch of stuff and I have to create customizations for every directory, but I want to automate all of them the same way, I, you know, the, at the same time. You see what I mean? The, the reason the customization controller does that is that that kind of matches up, that lines up well with how customizations work. But you still might want to patch all those things at the same time or automate all those things at the same time if you have more than one customization. You know, if, if you were in that situation where um, you had organized uh, to drag in bits of other people's stuff. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Like you were talking before about uh, referring to a customization that's elsewhere mm -hmm. and patching the image. And the, yeah, so you might want to organize those into different directories. And if you do so, um, then you might want to pick out certain of them to patch and certain of them to leave. Yeah, but. I'm doing that by specifying the image policy, which, ha which has the namespace and name. I mean, why do I need to filter more than that? That's that's wh why I, I'm. What I'm saying is that path overlaps with the actual custom resource ID. Why would you filter by path when you have to filter by image policy already? It will not just magically apply things if you if you don't specify a niche policy and you have to specify it. You have to in the file, yeah. Yeah. But I'm worried so why... about that being magic. That depends on how things are arranged in the cluster. Yeah. So why do we need paths? We don't need them, right? I'm not sure I follow. You're saying that because you have to name the policies every time you want something to be automated. Right, but you might have um, you might have two things which have different policies and you want to automate one and not the other, um, but they have the same name. I mean. How can two policies have the same name? Oh, well, they can be in different namespaces. Yeah, but inside the file, I'm identifying a policy by namespace and name, so they are unique per cluster. We should probably not do that. <laughs> we should probably do it. I mean, that, that's how you, you filter stuff, right? I mean, for the setters, I'll just remove paths. It doesn't make sense to me. Why would you specify paths when you already have the markers inside all the files? And if you oh, don't- my, reason, my reasoning is that you can, you still might want to automate some things at some times and, and not others, right? So even if you have the markers, you might want to, um, there might be some for some other automation to take care of, which is in a different context or a different cluster, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I mean, it. it's kind of, I realize it's sort of a, an argument from maximum flexibility. Right, and those don't always aren't always the best argument because you can also argue from you don't need it, you don't need that flexibility because you could just put things in a different namespace, put things in a different directory. Um, so, another another idea will be instead of using pass here to use the Git repository object that has uh, exclusion. So if I don't want to patch any kind of files in my production directory, I will just create a Git repository that excludes the production directory and the image update automation should take into account um, the source ignore like source controller does. So it will not be able yeah. to patch something because it's I, not- That there. occurred to me. The reason I didn't do that is because that is, to me, that's sort of in the bit of Git repository that I'm ignoring. <laughs> Like Git repository is for the image automation is purely there to give you access to that Git repository. And then what you do with it after that in the automation is up to you. So you, the, the people that are setting up um, the sources and, the, and for use by other things, um, if it's serving two purposes, not necessarily the same people that are doing the automations. The, you might set it up so you can use customizations over here, right? And your exclusions will work for that 
But as the person doing the automation, you might think, I just want to do an automation for all of the dev environment, and I don't care how it's kind of used in different places. Do you see what I mean? I guess you could set up two different Git repositories. One way you have the exclusions, one way you have the other. But that, that's, that's why I didn't do that. It's because I think of that as being a Git repository, repository that's being used as a source, not one that's just being used so that you can access that. Mm. But I, yeah. it could yeah. be repurposed, I guess. It, it, there is some sort of semantic crossover there. Yeah, I'm just concerned that people will ask for more paths in, in the customized custom resource, and that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, fair enough. Um, do you want to open a, an issue or a discussion or whichever you think is best about the paths thing? Another thing I cannot tell from the docs if patching tags is supported or not. Yes, I don't think I've written about that. You cannot use it for customize at all. Yeah, yeah. No, it is, or at least I intend for it. Yeah, it is. Um, so you get the full image name, you get the tag, and you get the um, the repo. And you just refer to them def differently. So yeah, you can. But yeah, it's probably not mentioned in the docs, which are thin on the ground. Okay. I'm yeah, just anyway. Checking, checking in the code whether it does include the namespace. It probably shouldn't, right? Because cross should, namespace I, things. I, I really like the fact that it includes the namespace. That's how I would filter my stuff. I'm not use paths. Feels wrong to me, but that's me. Well, it's worth having a discussion about, right? And then we can talk through actual, like it's quite tricky to talk about concrete use cases because or it is for me, because as soon as I start saying whatever my next thing is, I've I've kind of lost my picture of whatever the previous thing was about. Whereas at least the, in a discussion, that's you know you can just look above in the thread to see what it was. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. So I would I don't know before releasing uh, image automation controller. Zero one zero. We should uh, figure out the default. Oh, oh, it does include the name. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I misunderstood what you meant. Right, it does include the namespace, but it'll only use things from the same namespace that it's in. So it's not cross namespace references. Oh. It is filtering. You see what I mean? So, wow. So if you say, if you put a marker in that says you know, uh, dev colon policy. And then you run, that'll be ignored unless the image automation is in the namespace dev. Okay, so we... So you can uh, use it to filter, potentially. I think that's the right way around to do it as well. So everywhere... But let's have a discussion about it. Yeah, everywhere else where we refer to sources, we allow name and namespace. Does this at least work here in the image update automation? As in, can you refer to a Git repo in another namespace? Uh, no, I doubt it. It's a local object reference. And, I, and as you know, I don't think it's a good idea in the first place, but it doesn't work in image automation in any case. I mean, if every, every other API does that, why shouldn't image update automation to the same stuff? Why it's so special? Well, I think the other ones are special, but in the wrong way. <laughs> I don't think they should, but, but I didn't do it just as a matter of principle. I did it because it was, it's just how Kubernetes does stuff. Like I didn't do it as a reaction to the other things doing it and me thinking that was wrong. I just did it because that's the natural thing to do. Okay. Yeah. I I guess we should have a longer discussion on this. Yeah. I'm interested to see what Lee comes up with um, on the security model. I don't know whether he's actually looking at this particular stuff, at this particular thing, but we, we will find out. 
So I think Lee, what he's trying to do is um, make uh, the multi-tenancy stuff that I've built being native in Flux, instead of creating a policy to deny cross namespace uh, refs, uh, Flux would just ignore them with a flag. Um, oh, and, yuck. Okay, gross. Yeah. And we, I thought we decided against that anyway. Oh, yeah, cross mean, namespace get repo things or? Decide against what? Oh, uh, sorry. I, I got myself mixed up. Do you, are you talking about the uh, referring to sources outside your own namespace? Oh, okay. I beg your pardon. I was thinking about the other thing. Yeah, so right now I have a Kiverno policy that blocks this if you want to do it. And uh, Philip made one for OPA gatekeeper. So you can say, hey, for, for tenants in those namespaces, they are not allowed to refer sources from other namespaces. But for everything else, like the admin namespaces, uh, it is really silly to declare, uh, for example, um, the same source in every namespace. It's like, it's not even silly, is it you, you'll pay like with lots of, you know, credits, <laughs> this mistake. Like fetching, for example, uh, I don't know, um, the stable index in every namespace just because you you cannot share uh, a Helm repo across your cluster. I think that's not. But isn't that down to the implementation of the source controller? Hmm? Isn't that down to the implementation of the source controller? Not to no. fetch things multiple times just because it's mentioned multiple times? No, how we could do that? I mean, if you declare two sources, how it could know is the same source. Oh, it knows what the source is pointing to. Mm -hmm. It can have like, I don't know, different exclusion lists or whatever. Sure, but if you're referring to the same Git repo, say, then you can clone the Git repo once if you know it's the same Git repo. Yeah, but just check that some they... people have access to it. No, I'm, I'm definitely against that. <laughs> OK. Like, Imagine that you can set many things on a, on a repo. You can set, for example, in one namespace, I want this repo to be reconciled at 10 minutes and on the other namespace at one minute. What will happen if they have the same URL, then you'll also reconcile the other one at 10 minutes. Maybe I've set it at 10 minutes because I don't want the fast uh, apply to result from the commit. So I want to pull uh, less often or I want to disable that in that particular namespace and keep the other one there. Then we have to do mutex, locking, and everything else in, inside source controller. I don't think sources should be shared across uh, objects, even if they have the same URL. I, I, sure. If you want to follow the, the most Kubernetes way, it would be adding a cluster prefix to a resource. So we have roles and we have cluster roles. And you have cluster scoped resources and you have namespace resources and you can't correct rather them. than having cross namespaces. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah that's I mean, it. Run. that doesn't solve anything because you still need secrets that are namespaced. Yeah. And then you yeah, end up right. with cluster resources that reference namespace secrets, like I don't know, cert manager and others. And I think that's even a worse approach. Uh, cross namespace references are not something that I've invented in Flux. Uh, many other controllers support that. Contour does that for MTLS, so you can have a wildcard shared generated in an admin namespace and all your apps. Even if you don't have control on, on your charts, you can say, hey, I want to use that wildcard from that particular namespace. Glue does the same stuff. Istio, there are so many examples out there. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't use Glue as a good example, but look at like Cert Manager, for example. So Cert Manager has its issuer and its cluster issuer resource. Yeah, and the cluster yeah. issuer resource references a secret in a namespace. Yes. And creates a secret in a different namespace. How is that mm -hmm. better? I mean, 
it, it removes the, the 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 confusion of it. I think from a security aspect, if we end up in the audit, the the problem won't be the people in this meeting. Like we understand it for the most part, at least. But what I'm worried yeah, about is me. <laughs> everybody else who who's like, okay, it's unsecure by default, and we are allowing technically references cross namespaces and it's not visible that that's my worry it, it's but the cluster issuer allows you references across namespaces because you can say i want to use this key from this namespace and i want to create the tls secret in a different namespace so it affects a global object and also two namespaced objects yeah. I mean, Just because we, other people are doing it doesn't mean it's a good idea, though. <laughs> I want to point that out. <laughs> if we create a cluster Git repository and a cluster ham repository and a cluster whatever, customization cluster, all things cluster, you still have to reference um, SSH secrets, PGP secrets, and so on. So. No matter how you do it, in order to reach secrets, you have to go down to a namespace and, and use that. Uh, yeah, sure, but that Unless Kubernetes comes out with a cluster secret that I didn't heard of anyone trying to do that. Yeah, but, but that, that namespace could be flux system. It wouldn't have to be anything else than, than flux system. Like I, I, you wouldn't allow a tenant to create a cluster Git repository and then go, oh yeah, this is totally fine. It would, it would most likely be a cluster admin who would create the Helm stable cluster Helm repository or whatever thing you want to expose. And then you would obviously store the secret in, in, in Flux system if you want to do it that way. Yeah, or you have, well, I don't know, some other namespace with only secrets. Yeah, we, we do that with service accounts today. So it's Doing, doing magic things with service accounts in Azure. We have a service account in space where we, we place those types of things. So it's, it's not a bad architecture. But it's like, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm kind of happy where we are today also, because it's like I have the gatekeeper constraints so I can limit these types of things. So I'm just thinking about in the future when we do a security audit, what other people will say. Yeah, let's see what what um, Lee proposal, if it touches anything like that, or, and we can discuss it there. Um, yeah. And it is 11 o'clock, so that's the natural place to draw a line, I think. <laughs> we have a habit of ending these meetings with the whole namespace discussion. I know, it's starting to become a thing, isn't it? Maybe we should uh, make sure we don't. Uh, we need something, something light and fluffy to end on. Um, let's have a quick look at the agenda. Uh, well, Sarah point five is probably out this week, right? So that's pretty cool. All right. That's great. Yep. Oh, I did want to ask. Um, I can ask this offline, actually. I was just going to ask, is it worth going on and refactoring all the rest of the CLI commands in that same PR, or should I leave that sort of a yes, no thing, I suppose? If you feel up for it, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I, <laughs> I think I think you can do it in a separate PR. You you. Okay. Um, maybe a separate PR where you implement get all. Because get all <laughs> and force you to refactor everything. So a bit of horse trading going on. Yeah, you can do it in a separate <laughs> one as long as you also do this. Other. Fair enough. All right, that's a that's a lighter thing to end on. <laughs> I think get all will implies more refactoring that you did. <laughs> Probably. 
And in fact, all all the other um, well, like create Git repository, for instance, does more stuff than I need to do for um, any of the image things. So I think there'll be more anyway, more chopping and changing. But it works for the image things, so that's that's a good start anyway. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. See you next Great. time, or if not, have a lovely holiday season. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye.